get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Dmitry Dragalov, founder of Criminally Prolific and a service, JustReachOut.io, where he helps startups find and pitch journalists. Now, Dimitri has a lot of superhuman feats, some of them including helping a startup from zero to 40 million page views and getting acquired by Google, helping another startup from zero to 5 million users and eventually getting acquired by AVG, and he got 60 leads in 24 hours with just a landing page and a LinkedIn group, so you could probably do it too. Dimitri, thanks for joining me. Thanks. Thanks for having me. You are the rock star expert at building relationships with journalists, and we will talk about a little bit because you have a course on how to build relationships with journalists, so we'll link that up too. Um, and I will get into dig into this, so how other people can apply this to their companies, obviously. But I always like to start with a fun fact, and you have two really interesting fun facts. One, you were we were talking before, and you said you used to be over two hundred pounds. Yeah, yeah. I was actually like uh, two, a little over two hundred. You yeah. look about a hundred pounds wet right now. So. Yeah, I'm. I'm. What am I? One thirty-five or something? Wow. One forty. So what'd yeah. you do? Uh, well, I gained all that weight after I came here from Soviet Union, mm. and uh, well, it was it was Russia already then, uh, and uh, I gained it because there's just don't absolutely you know like. The amount of food, the amount of variety of food they had here in the States compared to Russia circa 1993 was just shocking to everybody. I think my mom, like, cried when we came into a grocery store and we saw, you know, like, a couple varieties of peanut butter, almond butter, like, all these different varieties of cheeses. And, like, we didn't have bagels. We didn't have peanut butter. We didn't have cereal. We didn't have... Most of the stuff, like juices, frozen juices, like none of that stuff. Your basic Russian grocery store is just like bread, butter, milk, meat, potatoes, cabbage, like just one of each, you know? And so I came here and started eating everything. Nutella, just pow, just just everything, like bagels, Nutella, pizza, Coke. You just went crazy when you got here. Like I would eat like jars of just Nutella, just I remember, or just everything I could get my hands on. I just go in the supermarket, just like mom, let's buy all this stuff, and we would buy it. And I just like eat, 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 eat. And my grandma would be cooking a lot too because you were so excited. And this was like a bad time in, in Russia, like you know, Soviet Union just broke apart. Russia yeah. was like, what was it? What? How old were you when you came? I was eleven, almost eleven. So what was and, it like before when you were in the in Russia? Oh, it was. You know, it was like a pretty tough environment. So you got like Soviet Union almost on the end, right? The the sort of like the central economy is ceasing to exist. Like Gorbachev is realizing all this. He's like pushing range. And then like the union breaks apart. Like Yeltsin comes. Uh, I remember Yeltsin is just like this crazy drunk. He's at the helm and he's just like, democracy, we should do democracy. So, like, Terrible inflation. The stores don't have much food mm. at all. People are just run on the banks, like just like super depressed. And we're trying to get out the whole time. Yeah. And you know, like growing up in the late eighties, like in in Soviet Union, like tons of anti-Semitism. That's why we came to the United States. Mm. Like you know, my family is Jewish. We're not religious or anything. Um, you couldn't really be religious, but like you know, like. Every passport, and that's like your driver's license. What was it like then. there when you say anti-Semitism? What were you experiencing? Well, like every passport that, so people had passports. That's how you go. That's where your driver's license is. That's how you identify yourself. And you have to carry it with you everywhere you go. Because like if you get stopped anywhere, like police can stop you anywhere else. You have to just like open up your passport and be like, hey, I'm a citizen. I'm legal, blah, blah, blah. And so you have this, this passport with you. Now, page five. There's a nationality page. 
You have to list your nationality. Now, in Soviet Union, nationalities are all the 15 republics. You got like Uzbek, Armenian, all these, all these republics, Armenia. And so, republics started leaving after a while. But anyway, like for us, it just said Jewish on it. Really? So it like Not a republic? No, it was just, we didn't, like, we were from Moscow, so there's no republic. It, was, it would say, like, Russian, I guess, usually, for Russians. And so, like, Russians, Russians, who were not Jewish, they would just say Russians. So we would say Jewish. And so, like, present that thing, and it's, like, all sorts of crap. Like, you would not get as much food because you would be in a long line, and, like, the person behind the counter would be, like, discriminating or... Mm. I don't know, you did get denied admittance into university or some kind of club or, or whatever. Like It was just like you'd get treated a little bit like a second-class uh, mm. citizen. And so, you know, there's my grandparents lived through that. My mom and my like dad, like they suffered a little through that. I think on the, at the end of the 80s, you know, things were much a little bit more liberal towards you know Jews, but you know you never hear like Jewish programs on TV or anything like that or or, or at radio, and like we came here and you know now it's completely different. You'll see all sorts of stuff on TV now. It's much more liberal, but well, back then it was it was kind of tough. So yeah, and Amit told me to ask you that you have a, some crazy stories in Russia and also barely getting out. Yeah, well, getting out was really tough because my dad didn't want to come with us. And so... Mm. Why um, not? It, well, you know, he was in the 40s. And so you, you spend your life living in one country and uh, right. your wife picks up and says, look, let's go. And you're like, well, you got to live. Like, you got to throw away your degree because it's not really worth anything out there. You got to yeah. get reschooled, right. learn a new language, learn a new culture, just adapt really to a whole new way of yeah. living. You don't even know what it's like over there. So it's like, he was like, look, I don't really want to do that. And my mom was like, well, we're going with my, my parents. We got, we got a refugee status. We, we're going to go. And he's like, you know, I kind of want the kids here. And my mom's like, I want the kids with me. It's crazy. <laughs> like, and so Tug of war. back and forth. Yeah. And yeah. he had this brilliant idea of like dividing us up. So he's going to have me stay with him back there. My mom out, get my mom out to, uh, to U.S. with my sister. And I was like scared, really scared, because um, the army is mandatory in Russia, and mm. so like the conditions are just terrible. Like people don't eat, and like the, there's shortage of food. Mm. That that's like a known issue. It's also really, really like what's a hazing going on. Like mm. in, if you're Jewish, it's like even worse. So it's like. I really didn't want to go. And I heard from my dad, like, his stories of being in the army. I was so scared. And and so, like, my dad was just like, yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to divide the kids up. And my mom's like, and so until the last day, almost until the last day, we already had our tickets, everything. We were going to go and leave that day. They wouldn't, he wouldn't sign the paper. And then my mom would be like, hey, I'll leave you the whole apartment. Like, you can take this apartment, sell it, be yours. But just just let my kids go with me. And so... One a few days before we left, he um, he signed the paper and let us go. And they would they exchanged, you know, like my mom gave him the apartment. And, and Did he but, end up coming over or staying there? He's never visited outside of uh, Russia. Well, really? he, yeah, he's never come to U.S. Um, he's he went to Israel once, I think, um, to visit Israel because why not? It's free. It's easy, if not free, but easy to go to Israel from Russia now. So. He went, and we were actually supposed to go to Israel originally because that's where it was easier to get a visa for because right. we were Jewish, so you could go without much hassle. And then about a third of our family left to go to Israel in the uh, earlier right. early 80s, and then, well, like mid-80s, I guess. And then we were like, look, U.S., and so we, we went to, we ended up going to U.S., but... I mean, that yeah, sounds, we, you talk about being scared about the army, but what about being separated from your mom and sister? I mean, did you? Yeah. Yeah, that was scary. I mean, like, my sister was two, so, like, I had a little bit of, you know, like, time, of course, like, with her, but I was still, like, 10, 11, I was, like, 
she's this little tiny thing. Like, That's I didn't a tough have situation because either realize. you leave your mom or you leave your dad, right? Yeah, and dad like wasn't around much. Like we didn't have a like a touchy. He wasn't like feely like, like a warm fuzzy dad character. Warm fuzzy, yeah. Like he was kind of like kind of like a hard Russian, you know, like. Like, I remember, like, my mom was tired. She, like, sat down next to him, put her head on his shoulder, and he was like, hey, what what are you doing? You can't find a pillow or something? Like, yeah. like, like, like you know, like the Russian. Really, like a man's man of like, type of Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, like, every culture has one, but it's yeah. just, like, he's just extreme. very, very extreme like that. And so I didn't have that much relationship with him, but he was cool. Like, he... It was like we would go out once in a while to do go into the woods to like go and ride cross country ski or yeah. go and like we went on like a little like winter retreat thing yeah. with like So Dimitri, when you got to the set. US you leave your dad, you leave what you knew from Russia. What did you want to do when you got here? Were you thinking anything in that respect? Um, I don't really know. I so I got here, and so the only sort of like I had a fatherly figure here, my uncle, and he was doing computer science stuff. Mm-hmm. So he was like programming computers, and he was my uncle. He was like about my dad's. No, he was younger than my dad, but you know, like he was older. So I was like, well, he was like the only. And then I had my grandfather, but my grandfather like probably almost retired, so there's nothing that I could have. He, he would he did construction stuff and for that Russia. time computer science was pretty cutting edge though right yeah yeah this was nineties so like and he was doing software development for uh, like um, like Las Vegas like the gambling machines hmm. uh, and so and he was doing all sorts of different like algorithms he was writing and he was using C plus plus and using Borland C plus plus which is like this before Visual Studio kind of thing, or anyway, like I saw him doing that, and and then my aunt was working as a like a QA test tester kind of person, uh, hmm. and, and so like they were into computers. So I was like, oh, maybe I should kind of check that out. And I um, I would beg my mom to get a computer, and I like when Windows ninety. I think we got our first computer was com- Compact Presario CDs. Series. I think I had like that too. Yeah, Windows three point one on mm-hmm. it, and and uh, it wasn't even like Windows ninety five. Like we didn't have the start button. It was still like the the old school three point one, and that was like all over that. I was like, wow, this is crazy. Like this thing, you go in. So you went yeah, into guess, computer science too in college, right? Yeah, yeah. So I ended up doing computer science in college for bachelor's. Um, uh, University of New Hampshire because we came to you know, to New Hampshire to immigrate to New Hampshire. So I is that random? random? I mean, how many people Russians go to New Hampshire? I don't know. Like there weren't any Russians in the place where we arrived. Now there's a few. Now yeah. there's a little bit more, but yeah. still, like you know, New Hampshire is just so country. You know, it's just this like tiny little place. And the only reason we went there is just because we knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody there. And it's like. <laughs> Right. That was the only reason. Everything seemed the same. Like we knew New York, we knew San yeah. Francisco, we knew LA, but we we're like, we don't know anything from anything in any of these cities. We just know yeah. the cities, like we've read about them, but yeah. we never visited them. We don't know anybody who lives there. And yeah. it's like, well, somebody told us that they know somebody who knows somebody yeah. in New Hampshire. So, and, like, so for Dimitri, you know, we'll get into the zero to 40 million pages, zero to 5 million users, but I find this so fascinating how you got there. And I think, you know, I'm listening to Cal Newport's book, So Good They Can't Ignore You. So I think like the journey is so important to show you didn't just land on someone's doorstep and you're like, okay, I got you. Five million helped you get five million users. You took this path, and what's interesting is, and when I my message you about it, you had these jobs at you know SolidWorks, Tybrand, Citrus, you know these software engineering jobs. You're like, oh, that's boring stuff. But it's interesting because you have the street credibility because you were one of the head software engineers. And I think when I read 
you even did stuff with the U.S. Department of Defense and things like that. Um, I did. Yeah. yeah. So I want to hear, at least even though it's boring to you, um, mm -hmm. what did you learn as a software engineer? What's a story from one of those companies that that you can talk about? Um, all right. They are drilling now here. This is... I can't they're, they're hear it on my end, you, actually. So. Okay, good, yeah. good, if you can't hear it. Um, so I got a computer science degree, and um, I, I needed a job, and so I started applying to companies around New Hampshire, and uh, one of them was BAE Systems, which was a Department of Defense contractor, yeah. which is funny because I was Russian, and right. in order to work for a depart Department of Defense contractor, you have to get a clearance, mm. like, a, like a secret clearance. And to get a secret clearance, you have to go through like a crazy-ass process with the Department of Defense and like all sorts of federal agencies and just like crazy stuff. It takes like two years. Not only do they make you fill out a book of papers, they actually call your references, and they have those references, reference other people. They dig your stuff up back. Like, they went to, like, people in Russia to, like, check my background, to check where my father lives in Russia. This is, like, crazy. And so I applied for this job, and I got the job, and then I found out, like, I got to go through all this stuff. And so they're like, all right, we'll hire you. You can work on stuff, but... Not on, like you can't work on the cool stuff until everything gets cleared. Right. And so I was doing stuff with, with flight planning. So like when a, a a plane, you know, like big plane, C one thirties, whatever. But they're carrying personnel, they're carrying um, cargo, whatever it is. They need to plan their routes, and I would write software for um, people to mm. do that for military, basically. So basically, work with the Air Force or or the Navy. And they would plan their routes, and they would get all that stuff onto a quick little like brick and this like a little data card that would go into the computer in the cockpit, and they would fly with it. And that used to be just there's so many much bureaucracy with that. Right. There was an auditor assigned to me personally every week. We'd meet with this auditor. Were you nervous would, at all that you'd mess up? Like you mess up his algorithm, and then they end up like not on yeah. the, the destination where I, they should be, or. <laughs> I was. It's not yeah. like you're doing software like, as a service. But, like but, you're directing planes and people somewhere. <laughs> Did yeah. that happen? Uh, yeah, um, well, uh, like there's so much QA that has to go through right. that nothing ever goes live until it's like five years after you've written it. Really? So it's like there's so much testing and redundant. There's like. Since you're writing data, you have to do so many redundancy checks and like double checking. Like you've just written a piece of data. Okay, let's take and write it back to the same source you've written it from and check it again. And then let's do it again and again and again. And so like, yeah, I was worried about it, but it was just like there's so many checks like and balances. Cool stuff. Yeah, so many checks and balances. And it doesn't matter. And I would never even see it live until five years of working there. It was like. It was just this like ancient machine. Like we're using like, like C plus plus was a big deal for them. Like they wouldn't use that. They would use like Ada and like these ancient languages from nineteen fifties or like, and the environment also seemed the same. Like these like gray walls. It was the plus, opposite of a startup the, type of thing. Oh yeah, like clearance. Once I got the clearance, I had to like behind locked doors. Like, just like stupid rules about cell phones. Like. There's just like rotating doors that would lock. Like it's just like got really? a little like way the hell out of my like cramping my style basically. <laughs> like I just want to write some cool code and create some awesome software. Right. I didn't want to go through all this like dealing with like commanders. We'd have like auditors that would audit my code every Friday and We'd have meetings with all these other people that would like look through it, and they were like military people. They would look at my code, and they'd be like, "Mitri, you forgot? Like, why did you do a for loop here? And why did you would like?" So would go they um, line by line look through my? Code? Would they actually? Was there secretive stuff that you can't you can't talk about because it was the government or not really? Just specifics, like. A, yeah. I guess like they wouldn't like want me to talk about specific projects and like, yeah, yeah. but I don't, I don't want them like knocking at your door, like 
like next week and be like, I saw your interview on Inspired Insider and you reveal a real top secret mission. Um, yeah, what's, no, what's also it's also interesting, just... you know, Dimitri, in your history is that you then tra- you transitioned from software engineering and I saw this transition to marketing, right? Was that deliberate or was it just the next uh, position that you found? Yeah. yeah, I think it was kind of deliberate. So I got kind of burned out doing this military stuff. I worked for CAD software for a little bit. I wrote mm-hmm. CAD software, which was a little more fun. I worked for SolidWorks and Parametric. And yeah. um, that was a little more fun writing that software. I still to this day say like SolidWorks is a software that get used a lot by people that create anything like desks. It's CAD software. Mm, so like right. any furniture, bars, anything out there that has like they have to be made. And so there's a feature in there when there's a little 3D model of it when they attach a balloon to the part of that. And that's what I wrote, that little feature. And so mm. people use it all the time. So. I use it. So, but anyway, like CAD software was fun, and then and after that, I um, I got burnt out uh, at the Department of Defense kind of type of stuff because uh, it was just so bureaucratic. One yeah. day, I just I just said, "Look, that's it." Like I was reading these magazines; they're Web two magazines. And uh, can you hear this, by the way? Or? I can hear it a little bit. I can go into another office too. All right, take me <laughs> but, uh, take me on a tour. Yep. So, um, so yeah, I was I was listening to this stuff and uh, and. Um, so, what was the next marketing? So, when you got into marketing, what did you have to do? Um, so the journey in marketing, really quick, is I went to uh, California. I was reading Web Two magazines and I learned about like Mark Zuckerberg and all this like making money on. SaaS products, and I was like blown away. Yeah. I need to do this somehow, and uh, and so I ended up uh, just picking up my stuff, getting into my Honda Civic with my girlfriend back then, who's my wife now, okay. and uh, driving cross country. So and I drove cross country for three weeks, arrived in Silicon Valley. So why did she agree to that? <laughs> um, she was gonna go and do. Um, grad school and so she wanted okay. somewhere new and different and so I was like no nah, I think it works out like I can I can go and do my Silicon Valley thing maybe I will even get an MBA because I know nothing about marketing I know nothing about business I know how to write code and right. so like we we're driving across country and we both were like we'll go grad school and so like we applied and I got into a grad school in Monterey, California, which is beautiful, like Monterey on the beach, like it's and it's the, the opposite middle... of Russia. Yeah, yeah, like you're <laughs> living on the beach. Like we live maybe ten minutes, fifteen minutes away from the beach. Yeah. Um, eateries, restaurants, right there. The school is on the beach. It's like, <laughs> like between classes, you hang out on the beach, and that was our life for two years. So it's like, but my primary objective. It was not to like go to grad school. I was like, yeah, I'll go to grad school just because like I can't just like not do anything. But I really want to work for a startup. Yeah. But I realized like nobody's gonna hire me. I got no experience. Like uh, people would be crazy to hire me. Like I know nothing about marketing, zero. <laughs> and so I arrived, and within a week or two weeks, I got a, a free internship job at a, at a startup. And that was Crossloop. That was the company. Oh, that was Crossloop. Yeah. So tell me about your experience yeah. at Crossloop because that was the one that grew from zero to five million users, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so Crossloop was fantastic. Like, uh, I met this guy, Renal, who was a uh, alumni of the grad school that I was going to in Monterey. And... Uh, I just got connected with him, and he, he said, look, you know, we're starting a new company. And he was number 20 at LinkedIn, so I was like, wow, this guy, like, this is a crazy connection. Like, because I've only been reading about these companies, like Facebook, LinkedIn, they're like big companies. This was like 2007, so I was like, wow, these are like huge companies, and he's number 20, like, whoa. And he's like, yeah, we're starting a new company. I'm like, wow, like. You know, I'd love to work for you. I'll do anything. And he's like, well, I kind of need somebody who knows marketing. Like, yeah, I don't. But, like, I'll do anything. And he's like, 
<laughs> well, let's like test your skills. And he's like, no, um, go put up a Wikipedia page about CrossFit because you know we're not really well known yet. Get some promotion that way. Right. And I was like, oh, easy enough. You know, like what is there to it? Like, create, you're a software engineer. A like that's not hard for you. Yeah. So let's, you know, Wikipedia is kind of easy to use anyway. You just create a topic and create a page about it. Mm-hmm. What I didn't know that. You know, you get attacked, attacked by their community right away saying, hey, why are you putting up this topic? This is self-promotion. Like, this is spam. Just get rid of this immediately. And so anytime you put up any pages, like, you get, you have to, like, stand up for yourself and be like, no, this is a real thing. Here's, you know, other articles about it. Here's a lot of people using it. Like, this is the, this is the company that's achieved this, this, and that. And so... I immediately like sprung into action. I was trying to keep the page up and I was asking Renal for all this information about the company and like I didn't know a lot about it and um you know, the page stayed up, it's still up now. And uh and yeah, and so he, he said, All right, that's that's something. So I'll, I'll give you a, a job. <laughs> it's that easy. You know? You're like, I got the Wikipedia <laughs> job, you could hire me for head of marketing. <laughs> Well, no, 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 the free intern. I know. know. (laughs) Oh, yeah, so it was uh, just internship. You know, I wanted to hear about some of the milestones of Crossloop. Like, what were some of the things that allowed you to go from zero to five million? Because you were there from the beginning. Yeah, so I guess Crossloop, we, we started out, it was a tech support marketplace, so... You find a technician and they remove a virus on your computer remotely through software we created and mm. uh, you know you negotiate a price and we keep a portion of it and at the time we needed to find people that were good at tech and were able to you know service computers and figure out what's wrong with them with through remote access yeah. and uh, we also needed just tons of people that would end up actually consuming these services and a lot of it was kind of, I guess, a lot of experience Murnal brought to the table. He was one of the co-founders. He was also in, like head of, I guess, all business and marketing stuff that he was doing at Crossloop is PR. And um, mm-hmm. that's where I started learning PR is Murnal. Yeah. Like he, um, he showed me, you know, you don't have to hire agencies. You don't have to hire anybody else. If you want to form a relationship with anybody out there, be it, you know, Walt Mossberg, or it could be, you know, Elon Musk or whoever it is. You know, you just learn about them, figure out their whole kind of deal, you know, what bothers them, what do they need, what do they really look forward to, and provide that for them and uh, build a relationship based on that. And he's like, he's always said, like, think of it as marriage. Like, you date the person for a while, like, you get married, you don't just, like, go for a one night stand. So so like you use the same approach to build relationships with right. media, with journalists, with press and uh, and so we ended up doing a lot of that. So um, we built um, he built a relationship with Walt Mossberg, but he helped he showed me how he did that. He, I was learning from him. And we're also doing um, you know, press outreach about different things that we're doing in the company, you know, like just stories of people just miraculously fixing their computers or how we would find people who use us and, and, and ask them to talk to us about what they do with Cross Loop and get those stories featured in, in different press outlets. And a lot of them had to do with press, uh, mm-hmm. but we did a whole bunch of like influencer reaching out. We reached out to a lot of different groups and, and, and Let's try the whole bunch of stuff. This experimental approach of marketing where you try mm-hmm. things and you fail quick and right. you try something. This was completely new to me, but I think this was my first marketing job, so I was learning a ton over the next two years. So you said, you know, Dimitri, what gave the most traction, what you saw gave the most traction is the PR and also reaching out to influencers. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. PR and influencers. So mainly getting press to write about yeah. us, uh, getting influencers to share our company yeah. with others. Uh, what was the biggest win you think um, under each of those categories? What was the biggest win for PR that you saw that drove a lot of users and, and traffic? 
we got covered by Walt Mossberg. Murnau flew out and met with him. He wrote a fantastic piece that ended up being requoted all over the place and mm -hmm. over and over and over again. And then um, I think we've been on like CNN or something, but I can't I don't remember. But these were like big, like big deal for us because we're yeah. like small startups. So like put us on the map. Like then tons of other stuff happened afterwards in terms of press that just like started. A snowball effect. That's sort of the cascade. Yeah, talk about the Walt Mossberg, because I know you said that you said he, you watched him build that relationship from the beginning. What did he, what were some of the things that he was teaching you as he was doing that? Yeah, he, um, he basically found him on a group chat somewhere and he was looking at the questions he was asking. And so he would provide just value in his answers. So he would email him with interesting resources or comparison studies of technology that he was talking about. So instead of emailing him and asking him about covering us or asking him about what he thought about our industry or something about us it was completely about Walt Mossberg, most of the emails that Renal would send him. Mm -hmm. And he would he would really provide value in every one of them. Somehow it would be just turned around and it would be very like facing towards Walt. Like he's he almost became his assistant in a way. Like he mm -hmm. thought of himself as being an assistant to Walt, even though he wasn't, but he would go and assist him. So he would look at what he's writing and he would think of things that would make that writing better and things that he would value and what would value and he would build you know like a trust relationship over that yeah. like the idea would be just to say to make sure that Walt thanks them and actually uses the stuff he provides and and it was like data he would provide them all sorts of different facts and like correct his spelling sometimes and just just stuff like that that he would build a relationship with him, with him on. Yeah. And then in the influencer side of things, what were some of the influencers that you were able to reach out to? Because that is also big in, especially in the tech community that probably has a close-knit group. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Marinal, like, he had relationships with, like, Pete Cashmore. Ashable and like Robert Scope and like um, who worked from TechCrunch back then. He's at Demo, I think now, and all these like oh Mark Erickson from TechCrunch, just like and you know like those relationships. Like Renal would publish these guest articles on TechCrunch and Mashable, and I would be just mesmerized. I'd be like, wow, this is crazy, like. The tech crunch and we get, he gets to publish on that thing. Like guest articles are crazy. Like how can you even score placement like that? And PR agencies would charge ten thousand dollars a month and get you like three or four of these a month. Or, and Renal was just like doing it himself. He was forming these relationships and he would publish these articles on like these big publications and it was just him talking about startup life and teaching people something in the article, but in the bio it was a link back to us, so it would like drive some traffic. And I was just like shocked the way he did things. I was like, I need to like get more into this and learn how to mm -hmm. become really good at, at this. Cause, you know, I can I can try and do this too maybe someday. Yeah. This is, I mean, there's a current example of this, Dimitri, and you know, obviously, Someone in the audience may be thinking, well, I wasn't number 20 in LinkedIn. I don't know the founder of Mashable or Robert Scoble or all these people. But you have an example lately that we were talking before we started about, tell the story about the, the guy who was the company renting, uh, renting furniture. You, he came to you and was asking questions. And yeah. What did you tell him to do and what happened? Yeah, so Rami came to me, and uh, I'm actually about to email my entire email list about this story. But uh, mm. you know, he he runs this company that lets you rent out your furniture uh, if you don't want it. So if you're moving somewhere or you just have it, you can just rent it out to someone else. Yeah. And he's here in New York, and he's this young guy, and 
he needs some press and he wants some traffic through his website, through his business. And it's like, I don't know how to do this. And, you know, PR agencies cost a lot of money. And so he came to me and I kind of told him kind of what I was telling you and showed him some email templates. I, I write about this stuff all the time. So there's tons on my blog. And, and so, uh, I, like, he reached out to a few publications and he got published by DNA Info, which was this hyper like local blog here in New York, pretty popular DNA info dot com. Mm -hmm. And then the, the Fox News Channel <laughs> saw that article, reached out to him and lined up an interview with him. And they just finished the interview yesterday or this morning or something. Yeah. And it aired and now he's like there's too much traffic or something, like the site crashed, but um so it's I was a good like, problem you know, to have. I'm gonna so I'm gonna try and uh, like teach this to everybody. So I'm like, I'm gonna do a webinar and like just tell everybody I can. Just like get a, tons of people in a room and just explain exactly the same thing I did to him, just so that more startups can do this. You know, like right. form these relationships on their own. So what were some of the so, things that he did do to get that DNA info that kind of caused that cascade? You were talking about email templates. Yeah, so I mean, relationship building is one thing, and I think it's really important to do. But if you have like something time sensitive, the pain, the like, the main thing you want to do is just find the most relevant journalists, or reporters, or influencers to what you're trying to pitch. And that doesn't mean that like they covered you know renting furniture a year ago or or even like a month ago just once. Like it really means like. They've been covering like furniture or the, the the whole Craigslist or renting, you know, industry, the renting industry for a long time, right. and, and maybe you know that's what their passion is is to write about this stuff. And so it's a little tough to like. There's a lot of different kind of techniques, tools, but you just gotta be sure that this person is really, 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 really interested in what you have to say. Right. Um, if you're not going to build a relationship with them. My, my preference is to invest time up front and start building relationships just because, just like Renal was doing, just building relationships, providing value, becoming their assistant, and eventually when you have the ask, you don't have to like do it right away. You can do it later on. Uh, but, um, you know, like if you got to do it last minute, just make sure it's super relevant. Very relevant. You know, it fits. Yeah, and so like with Rami, it was... He reached out to the person at DNA Info that covers like smart, unconventional, quirky, fun startups in New York City, and uh, it has to be like young people, like under twenty-five or something. And he, he's really young, so he's like, "All right, well, this kind of fits. Like everything this person has been covering is this kind of stuff. You look at their bio; that's exactly the type of stuff they write about." I'm just gonna pitch him. I'm gonna be like, I'm, and and his pitch was just very personal. It wasn't like this giant press release stuff people send around. There was no many links. There's there's one link in there to his website. There's no attachments. It's just you know like short, succinct, two hundred mm. words, subject line less than sixty characters, personal. Just hey, you know, I'm a kid. I got this thing going. I'm I'm doing this, and it's fun. And you ran about fun startups and. I, I love you know to chat with you guys because we got this big thing happening. So it worked for him, and I think the bulk of work he did was really doing the research, finding the right type of journalist to reach out to, and just being in the right place and time. You know, like that helps with the Fox News finding that article. So, Dimitri, what's yeah. the biggest mistakes? I mean, you get a lot of people asking you about PR, and you have tons of articles about. Um, how to get PR. What's some of the biggest mistakes you see people making when they come to you and are asking advice? Um, I think the biggest mistakes is that everybody's thinking about making lists of people to contact, this giant uh, sort of like email list, and, and then pitching everybody the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I see this everywhere, you know, here's my, my pitch templates and here's a generic uh, sort of template of the list that I create. So here's like my list, like name, publication, Twitter handle, and bio. And the problem is that like everybody is a different person. Not everybody is exactly the same. Even though if they all write about the renting market or renting furniture, 
it doesn't mean like everybody is the same. It might be one person, you know, actually prefers, you know, like New York quirky startups and the other person might prefer, you know, Craigslist type of stuff, like the craziest things rented on Craigslist or something. Like, like mm -hmm. that person might be doing industry nationally. Like, it, so, it, and then as a person, these people might be different. It might be like a 60 year old guy who's been a veteran journalist who's just, you know, changed his beat to this. Or it could be like a 20 year old that is, just got a job at Mashable and it loves it like and it's just like putting out quick posts here and there so like your language is going to be different your tone is going to be different right it, it like pretend you're standing next to them at a bar you're not going to start the conversation the same way with a 60 year old guy versus like a 20 year old guy so taking all that into account like it's just the pitches have to be super quality, like super targeted to mm -hmm. each and every person and not to everybody else. And I see this over and over again. I was just reading the blog post today. I got in an email and said, here's my process. I create a list. Here's the list. Here are all the people. They're all targeted. Yes, they're all right about this topic, but like they're all individuals as well. So tailoring at the pitches to each and every one takes tons of time. Nobody wants to do that. Right. So like... Yeah, you know, like I even did like I did a follow up based on my um, I launched a course recently, and I just didn't have time to reach out to every single one that signed up but didn't purchase the course. Yeah. So I just sent one generic email to everybody, and you know, like open rate was just like really really low, and click rate was almost nothing, just because I didn't dig in and say like, yeah. Hey, John, looks like you run the site. This looks cool, but how about this? By the way, I wanted to follow up, blah, blah, blah. Like that kind of yeah. personal email gets that action, that response back. If yeah. you just, hey, John, like, saw you write about this. I got this. Check this out. It's like, it doesn't get that same response. Right. So I'm always pushing people to just invest yeah. time. It's okay that you don't send out 100 emails. Send out 20, send out 10, mm -hmm. but make them really like quality emails. They're well researched. Like, is and and those people will respond to you and that's fine like and it's not quantity it's just, i think it's quality so you always default to even though it's going to take a lot more time and you can't get to everyone you default to just taking that time and responding individually to people yeah 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 and uh and really researching make sure that these these emails are really well researched when you're pitching because you're mm -hmm. reaching out cold a lot of times yeah or if you're following up on something uh, chances are they checked out your website right. or something they signed up for updates so it's like what are so some I, key... I try and do it as personal as i can like, yeah and Dimitri, i know you have several posts on this too and you recommend a friend who has a service uh, it was like an email service um who does copywriting and design but I'm wondering what um, what things should people be looking for as far as components to include in the actual email when they're reaching out cold because you're really good about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I just wrote an article for Forbes which I'll share. It's called Cold Emailing and mm -hmm. sort of how to cold email prospects and get a response. Yeah. Um, and uh, in there, I actually show you the email templates that work the best in terms of cold emails. Mm -hmm. But, and I go through the process of how a cold email should be structured. But uh, I think the biggest thing you want to do is create that tie in with that person, like that direct connection. So uh, the first thing is really always about them, mm. and it's always value to them. And so yeah. I always think of it how a conversation might unfold with a stranger right. if you're waiting in a line with someone or if you're at a bar and you just met somebody you know you say hello they say hello if you don't know anything about them you say hey are you from around here they might say yes right. I'm like you can say yes I'm from around here too okay that that means there's something in common then you can kind of delve more into what are your interests what are my interests yeah. Is there any interest in common? With web, you can find all that out. You can figure out right. where a person lives, what their interests are, and specifically what their opinions about those interests are because you can yeah. look at a whole a lot of information on the web. So if you know somebody's opinions about a specific issue, 
how can you respond to that? How can you respond to those opinions and in, somehow provide value for them? Is it like can you share data with them that would make sure, like make sure that uh, like contradicts their opinions, or maybe it uh, underlines and you know like it's maybe it's the, quite the opposite. I don't know, but like can you provide something yeah. that uh, verifies their opinions? I don't know, like but that's the first part of the email, and then after that, you might just want to start off a conversation about that. You don't want to start doing a lot of pitching and what you're doing because if that conversation is interesting if you add enough value to them up front then they will naturally eventually come. they'll ask you yeah. yeah they'll ask you what you do you do you don't that's what Renal used to like teach me all the time it's like look they'll ask you what you do when they're really ready and interested don't don't go heavy on the pitching up front and right. so one thing you do really well which I've noticed with when I was doing the research is you do tons of research about people so you really find out how you can provide value and you can make it about them. What's a recent example that you can tell people about, Dimitri, where you actually sent a cold email and what you found was that common bond with someone so people can kind of hear what, what that example would be like? Yeah, um, just uh, the other day. Um, so I, I created a course called um, How to Get Free Press for Your Startup. Uh, and launched it and tipped it on Product Hunt and it got almost 200 upvotes. I got thousands of people come over to my site and I had the Sumo Me uh, plugin that would open up to ask people for their email address every time they would visit my site because yeah. you know like not everybody's gonna purchase my course but I want to capture everybody who comes to my site and sure. email them after. So I got like 150 emails and so I had a little bit of time, so I did this, so I actually looked up, like, who are these people? So I started going on, about 150 people, I sent maybe 10 personal ones. Mm -hmm. And one of the guys, this guy, Ian, and all I could find about him is, like, he worked for this huge, like, boring company, a software company in the middle of Utah. And I was like, what does PR have to do with anything? Like, why would you even leave your email for a... I started with PR, and I couldn't find anything else. I'm like, the guy lives in Utah. He's been like QA software guy. Like looking at his Twitter, I'm like, I don't know. He mentioned some startup stuff in the Twitter. I'm like, he's kind of young. I'm like, oh, maybe he's starting a startup or something. That's why he wants to learn how to do PR. So in the email, I'm like, Ian, man, like I was checking out your your bio. Like I was looking at all this stuff in Utah, and I'm like, I just can't figure out like. How is PR related to this boring software company in Utah? Like, there's no way you guys are going to be doing PR and you're doing like QA and software for them. Like, how is that related? Right. Why would you even leave an email on my site? I'm just like curious, if nothing else. I looked at your Twitter. You seem like you're interested in the startups. Are you like doing a startup or something? And he replied and he's like, wow, this is like, this is a pretty have like detailed. Like you did some detailed research about me, man. Like it's kind of crazy. You're like I'm a Russian but, spy, and I have the Department yeah. of Defense. I can find anything I want like, out about you. He's like, but you know, all the info is public. Like, yeah, but he's like, yeah, you kind of got it. You know, I'm, I'm I got this startup. I've been working on it on the side after work. Mm. I want to learn how to do PR and get journalists, and and so I got a response from a response from rather surprising. Like, hey, like I was like. Just crazy amount of information you told me about myself and the email and hmm. a valid question you asked me about what I'm doing and you know it was just it's a very personal kind of like thing very personal yeah other stuff could be very different like could be data that contradicts with somebody's like opinion about 360 cameras like there, there's people that write about 360 cameras and how they're kind of going to be uh, obsolete because uh, you know Google has been using them for a while for Google Maps and that's a great uh, great use case but they're too expensive too clunky too big for real people to use and then if you look at like the use or like number sold like consumer wise like it's a pretty hot topic we got way tons more people are buying it month over month mm -hmm. 360 cameras and so I've done 
than that. Like I would say, oh, here's a report that contradicts what you wrote about. Like, mm. would love to kind of hear your feedback about it. And so people would respond back, like, oh, like hey, the, the easiest one is like, hey, I've got a spelling mistake on your article. Like, that always gets a response, like, thank you, awesome. Like, <laughs> so, you read it close enough so. that you catch a spelling mistake. It's good. Yeah, no, I can see yeah. how you do that. I mean, you make it really personal, and you do your you do research essentially by doing that, and you just find out whatever you want. And you know, I want to talk about Zurb a little bit and your experience there. Yeah. But but first, I'm curious because we're talking about PR, and obviously you created JustReachOut.io. So what was yeah. the pain of, and why did you end up creating that? Well, it was just startups. You know, startups waste tons of time and money on PR agencies. And, and I was just sick and tired of startups doing that over and over and over again. I stopped doing that a long time. And I'm like, look, it's not that hard. Just do research on journalists. And I'm like, well, no, like, I don't know how the best to do that. And so I would teach them. But and so I'm like, look, I'm just going to build a tool where you type in keywords and the thing is going to learn based upon your profile, what you do day to day, and machine based on what journalists write, uh, what's the best match for you? Best for you. And so I programmed it myself. I launched, you know, like I got 200 startups now, and we're rebuilding to actually be much better because the soft back end was just kind of scrapped together by me, you know, like, and so it's not as as uh, as good as it should be, and so. We're gonna relaunch it in like next week, I think a week after that. But you know, like the pain point was just no more hiring PR firms, no more hiring consultants. Like startups are gonna do them, they're gonna learn so it's not that hard and I'm gonna get most startups doing this. And there's like all these tools out there are not good. Like I've used Muckrack, I tried to use C <sighs> And I tried to use press friendly. I tried to use all these tools out there, and they're good, but they're just not great. And I wanted something that finds the most re relevant drama for me and gives me their contact, gives me their sample views to email them, and I can do reaching out much easier if I was a startup or for myself. And so. I built the tool. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. let it catch up for a second. It seems like the uh, the bandwidth is eating up some of the, the video. But, um, you know, what's interesting, too, is that, yeah, I tried it. I, I worked with your tool. It's pretty pretty slick um, the way it kind of gives you a couple results. And then it sends you, like, the rest of the results to your email. Um, and what I also found interesting is you put it on Product Hunt. And you got some interesting advice. And even Peter Shankman responded and he sounded like he was interested in giving feedback. What kind of good feedback did you get from the people from Product Hunt when you put it on there? Yeah, it was great. So, uh, so right now, if you log in, and that you don't have to, it doesn't limit the search results if you're signed up, but if you're not, it uh, limits them by three so that mm -hmm. people give me their email addresses so I can them later on. But um, Yeah, I think that's um, smart. I was even I, thinking you should limit it to two uh, or something. But yeah, I think that was smart. Yeah. Maybe I'll do two. But, uh, but, Peter Shankman reached out. He actually wanted to be like an advisor and help out. And um, yeah, lots of feedback. That, you know, one thing that I kind of understood right away is crowd loves this topic. Like, startup people love to talk about how to get press and PR, and they don't really have a very good solution. Right. I think a lot of people are have been burnt before, and so they look at it as, oh, like another tool. Okay, great. So like press is press PR can be like very boring to startups and it's not sex and it's not something that people want to embrace and love but they need to do it and and so um, I I want to make it 
And it's like Noel Kagan, when I wrote an article for Noel Kagan, he didn't want to write that uh, post that article at first. I read that. The was... top part of his article basically says, I did not want to send this out. Yeah. <laughs> and it's because, like, PR can be terribly boring, and nobody really wants to talk about press outreach, all this stuff. But, like, if you put it in a term, like, layman terms, like, for startups, and you actually tell them, like, dude, just do this. Like, do this research. Do this, follow this step by step. This formula will get you press, and then you'll be on your way. And so yeah. um, I did it, put in those words. And um, so, yeah, the feedback so what's I got. The, was what's the of name stuff. of your course, Dimitri? What's, what's it called? I think it's Startup uh, How to Get Free Press mm -hmm. for Startups. Um, and it's, uh, okay. it's on my site, it's on Criminal I Politics, think you but, should rename it. How you can crash yeah. a website with too much traffic. Yeah. Something. something. How you can crash your... Because that's like. basically... Because it makes me think about that guy's example for the, the furniture, right? Everyone wants their... Yeah. I mean, you don't want your site to crash, but, but everyone essentially wants... You want to have so much traffic that your site crashes. Yeah. Like, that's what the course should be called. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I will. It's easy to change. Or something like that, because like you, you just made me think. Because Noah, obviously, is like I don't want to, PR is boring. I don't even want to. Obviously, he published it because it wasn't boring. As he started reading, it got better and better and better. But people do have that initial like, oh, PR. I don't see it like that though. I see it as PR is going to basically how you get more traffic to your site, essentially from leveraging other it's people's true. audiences. Yeah, you know. Yeah, it's true. But um, yeah. But yeah. So, what are some of the gems of the course um, that you can talk about? I mean, people will check out the whole, the full thing. Well, but what are some gems people should know about? In the course, I started out with like a practical example where I just tell you how I did PR for Polar mm. and how we got acquired by Google. Yeah. And how I grew Polar to forty million page views a month. Uh, through PR, just pure, pure doing repress outreach. Yeah. Uh, and then I take that process and I say, hey, how can you adopt it to your startup? So I go through the steps of taking that process, just, just adapting it into a different, you know, like, like different startup. I actually go and reach out to press live during the class. So hmm. I reach out to the journalists and sh show you how I write emails, how do I guess email addresses for journalists, how do mm -hmm. I do all that research I talked about, I mean, a practical example, just live. And then, you know, I talk about email templates, email pitch angles, different, mm -hmm. spend a lot of time about research, just a lot of practical examples, I guess. I think at the end, you kind of, you kind of get it, like what you got to do. It's, um, you watch this course and you're set to go. Like, I give you all the email templates, all the information you need to kind of, do your research and find journalists, reporters, influencers on your own. You just got to invest time. And yeah. You, you, you just and then sometimes if you want, I'll even like help you after the course, like write your email pitches and stuff. So what was some of the a couple of the milestones? Because again, I was reading. You know, you went help them go from zero to forty million page views, and they got acquired by Google. And uh, if people don't know what Polar is, it's uh, basically creating polls, right? Like mini quizzes, like do you like this yeah. or this, right? So what were some of the things yeah, that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What were some of the things that worked really well with that particular service to get them into the media and get more exposure? Well, this may finding trending breaking news mm -hmm. and figuring out what type of poll would work really well in that article that would actually improve that article mm -hmm. so like it will get people to stay on that article longer it will get people to voice their opinions it would get them more engaged so it would share those opinions that they shared on the article with other people on Twitter or Facebook and get mm -hmm. those people to come back to that article so that was the thinking behind the approach mm -hmm. that I used and I fell down a lot before I actually got to that. So I was just trying a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. This is the approach that actually worked. And 
kind of ran with it for a couple of years, just day in, day out, reading breaking news, trying to figure out which polls to create. So like, like soccer, when the World Cup was going on, you know, create all these crazy polls like this versus that versus like basketball, like March Madness, like any kind of like iOS 6 versus iOS 7. We did um, Sony PlayStation versus Xbox. There were like all these different polls during the time when these events were hot. Yeah. We would create these polls for journalists. I would pitch it to them and say, hey, do you want more people on your blog or your news publications to stay longer? We can actually measure it. Like, we'll measure it for you. We'll say, and then we'll tell them, like, hey, you, you just got like 93 more hours on your mm. article because you put this poll in. Yeah, it's huge. And this many more people. So, like, would make it my very like a big value prop for right. them. And, and of course, we would drive traffic to our stuff because it was our embeds of the poll. So yeah. we people come back to our site, we drive traffic and exposure. Yeah, that's smart. Um, I mean, it's huge value of if they write an article, they want more people on it. They want people staying as long as possible to engage with it. Um, what do you remember, Dimitri, that you thought this poll is going to be the best poll ever? And it just fell flat. And on the flip side, what was one of the best, best uh, performing polls? Um, I always thought like the red carpet polls were really good for some reason. Like what? I was What's like, the red carpet polls? Uh, I don't even watch movies. I don't have a TV. Like two but, actresses, like, you mean? Yeah, like actresses match up. Like who has a like who's prettier or like. Who's like sexier? Who's got like cooler haircut? And, and so like I don't know. Like I just always felt like like this will go crazy. And like we had this pub, uh, Hollywood.com. It's like they were using us, and uh, it was just like like nobody really cared. I think hmm. nobody really voted, and they put us up on the sidebar. And it was just like the questions were just way shallow. Like we're I don't know, we got some votes on it, but it wasn't like a very good, I guess you should have been asking things like, which movie's going to win at the Oscar Awards? Mm -hmm. Not like, who has like a sex body or something. You're thinking like, like a guy. Know, like it was just, right. You're yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's like. Uh, so what so other polls, what were some of the most successful polls? Because this is interesting because it goes into the kind of the um, audience psychology. The best, one of the best ones was Sony PlayStation. Both were coming out around the same time, and we ran this poll, which actually said people prefer Sony, and that got picked up all over. Like International Business Times covered mm. it, and all these GameSpot and all these blogs kept coming, coming, coming. To the point when Sony had an earnings call and the Sony CFO quoted our poll saying, wow. hey, like Sony seems, based on, on polls online, Sony seems to be doing 20% better than Xbox in terms of preference. And they wow. were like, wow, this is like funny. You're, you're uh, you know, affecting stock prices. Yeah. Like, it's just crazy like that. I guess that was one of the bigger ones. I, iOS 6 versus iOS 7 was a big one for us. We, we probably drove over a million view um, votes with that. We met, at the time, people were resisting change to iOS 7. They were just uh, kind of stuck with iOS 6. And they're like, oh, iOS 7. Like, Apple is not the same anymore. It's too much change. The, our, our icons look like Microsoft. It's just like this, like, there's just a lot of buzz going on around this time about yeah. this. And we just, we matched them up. We said, hey, here's the iOS 6 icon. Here's the iOS 7 icon for, yeah. what, for the clock. Here's the next one, next one, next one. Match them up. And people love the iOS 7 stuff better. And so we published the results. And everybody started, like, going back saying, oh, my God, I can't believe iOS 7 won because people love iOS 6. And, and so at the time, I think this was... Very timely, very timely. Yeah. You know what I, I made a note of, Dimitri, which you talk about in one of your posts is best subject lines. Like you could write the best email ever. And I think in your, in your post it said, you know, 
33 percent won't even get to the the rest of it or something so you know there's some big stat that if you don't have a good subject uh-huh. play they're not even going to read the rest so what are some of uh, the things people should think about when creating the best subject lines or what are some of the best subject lines um i think subject lines you know they're probably i usually try and do it under 80 characters under 60 would be great um I think they have to be something that kind of communicates your personality mm-hmm. and, and matches that personality with whoever is receiving the email. Mm-hmm. So, like, if you're contacting somebody who's young and going fun, is doing startups, you know, like, you're not going to capitalize every word in your email subject line. You're also not going to just be formal. You're going to be, like, all lowercase, just going to be, like, Sitting down with them, having a you know a glass of beer or something, and uh, and just like shooting the shit kind of thing. Like, hey, uh, just this is this is what I'm doing, and this is why it's cool. So it's like summarizing everything in the email into one line. So it's like trying to do that one sentence pitch exercise by a mm-hmm. Masi from Founder Institute, which I talk a lot about. Yeah, which is like. There's this formula in Adlib that he uses, and it's really, really, really like actionable. It's like my company does X through the secret sauce to help people do this, and that's all there is. And so, trying to use the same mentality but put the rest of the email into that one subject line that's like fun. So, like, I don't know, like, like tomorrow I'm gonna send an email out to my entire email list, and it's gonna say, um. In three days, I'm going to reach out to journalists on a webinar live in front of everyone or something like that. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I don't know, it's like my, my readers love this stuff. This stuff they want to like look over your shoulder press. and see what you do, essentially. Yeah. 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 So it's like something different. Nobody, not a lot of people are going to email other people and say, this is what I'm going to be doing tomorrow. So it's like, it stands out in people's inbox, stands out. And, oh, like I, I always try and think like, what does pe- what do people's email boxes look like? It's mm-hmm. usually like just a mess of stuff, and when they're glancing at them, they're looking not for your email. They're looking for something else. I'm sure of it, unless you're doing business with them. And you know, how do you stand out on top of everybody else's email that is really important that right. they're doing business with that they need to respond to? How do you stand out and make them be like? You know what? I'm gonna take like 10 seconds, click on this thing just to see what it's all about. Mm-hmm. Like, how do you how do you compete with that? Because you're always on the second or the third tab of your of the browser for them, even if they open anything. Yeah. So it's like it has to have. And so I send emails to myself a lot, trying to understand. Like, I don't know, trying to put myself into their shoes, trying to think like, okay, this is what their inbox is gonna look like. This is who they are. This is the type of language they use when they tweet and uh and it's pretty good I don't know, there's an app called crystal nose like k-n-o-w-s crystal i think with a c but mm-hmm. what they do is they actually tell you when you write your email saying hey your tone is a little off here like, really this person hmm. they kind of yeah this this person likes very normal tone and by the way like don't say thanks, you know, at the end. Just just put your name. So like the the app is a is a Google plugin. It's a Google Chrome plugin. Well, that's cool. Crystal knows. I'll have to, it, uh, I'll have to check yeah. that out. And uh, those guys are great because they they'll scour the web, and they'll find every public piece of writing this person has done, and so they'll parse it and they'll try and learn hmm. kind of like how do, how do they talk, and uh, it's pretty good. It's kind of like. They're trying to do a little bit of my work for me. Crystal knows. All right, let's check out that. And while we're on that, Dimitri, I want. What are some other resources people should check out? I know in your writings you talk a lot about BuzzSumo. If people don't check that out or don't know about it, they should. Uh, you you rave yeah. about that. What else should people be looking? Uh, at? Let's see. Like um, Email Hunter is really good. Mm-hmm. I use that a lot. Um, emailhunter.co mm-hmm. is the URL where I can find email addresses and the format of the email addresses that I just in general just good for like email like finding 
Um, let's see, like creating images, I use like shareasimage.com, which is really cool. It, it lets you kind of really easily pick an image, put some writing on top of mm. it, create good looking. It's, it's like. I always wonder how people like, do that. Yeah. It's was, so easy. Shareasimage.com. Mm. Um, it's like online. At, I forget five dollars or something a month, but it it's it's royal. It's like royalty free images that you can. They already have the images. They have everything. It's just like nice formatting and everything. So it's just it it helps a lot. I yeah. think with um, I don't know. Like, I'd say like copy hackers are really good, but I don't. They're it's like a, a firm you hire to yeah. do your copy. Joanna, I've interviewed. Yeah. Oh, you have it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, they really love what they do, and they have something called Snap now, which is Snap Copy, which is one of their services. But it's uh, yeah, they're pretty, really good. They have really good information. Also, I wrote down from my research from you, Buzzsumo, just reach out, obviously. Io, email finder, you've mentioned, and then you mentioned um, Sapphire. I think that's the person with the email copy, or is that something separate? Yeah, um, email finder isn't as good as email hunter. Email, oh, email hunter is better. probably the best. Okay. Emailhunter.co, um, charlieapp.com. Charlie app tells you right before you're gonna meet with somebody, uh, you know, uh, what are they all about? It tells you all the information you kind of need to know mm. in terms of. Um, uh, Sapphire runs a site called Art of Emails. Art of Emails, and, yeah. And Sapphire is different. Yeah, and I work with her on a number of projects. She's actually working on a project with me now, but. She actually worked, or used to work, or still works for Copy Hack hmm. um, as well. So really asked this for them, and uh, she's just great. She's out of Toronto, and she um, she's a great copywriter. And so she she has this this site, Art of Emails, where there's just like a lot of emails in there that are just oh like tons. best practice. Yeah, and uh, it's a site to check out if you're just stuck in terms of like what kind of email would you want to use it seemed like an amazing kind of free resource like you could literally pick by category if you want some whatever email on branding or whatever it is you could literally just choose and then she has a bunch of templates there it's pretty cool yeah yeah just like, like nice templates that i would like check out once in a while so dimitri, stuff. dimitri we're um over time i appreciate your time um sure. And because I have so many more questions, but I'm going to limit it because I still wanted to hear about Zurb and what you did because you worked with clients like Facebook, Netflix, Salesforce, and you also interviewed some of the top founders, which I was able to, to pull up some of those interviews. Uh, you interviewed the founder of Box and, and a number, Tim Ferriss yeah. and a bunch of other ones, which yeah. were really good. Um, and I still want to know why you call it criminally prolific. I'm scared to ask that you're like a secret agent from, from Russia. Um, but what I want to ask first is since it's inspired insider, I want to know, you know, we talked about a lot about successes and I want to know what's been one of the lowest points. What's been a tough time that you had to push forward through? I think just, you know, criminally prolific. It's the reason I named it criminal prolific, by the way, is it's so prolific. It's criminal. So <laughs> okay. my wife came up with a name. So it's like, I'm so prolific. Like, you know, but like going on my own, I think not working for anybody um, and being in my home on my own, my laptop, which is just like kind of like a lonely place to be where I didn't know kind of how to build the business going forward, where I had these skills on how to market stuff, but I haven't been working in marketing most of my career and to go out on my own and say, look, like, I can do some consulting, but like I don't want to be doing consulting my entire life. And I want to build something that's sustainable and fun, that's a product or a course. And I just don't know how to do all that. And I can keep doing consulting. I can keep helping people reach out to press and build outreach efforts, or I can maybe learn some other marketing techniques but I don't know how to do something more efficient or do something like I wanted to build a tool or I wanted to build 
my own app or my own product, my own courses, but I didn't know how to do any of that. And I seemed like I didn't have time to do any of that because I, I was like, I had to do consulting with these clients because I needed to earn cash and money and I just couldn't like, you need to feed your so, Nutella, Nutella habits. No. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, by that time, I think I probably lost <laughs> most of the weight. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, like, I just trying to figure out how to improve my business offering, mm -hmm. how to figure out what it is that I'll be kind of doing day to day, and really find my way. It took me a lot of time, and really, I think quitting working for somebody else and transitioning to working for yourself is fun but in a way it's like yeah, everybody says it's scary but I mean it's just like at some point you're thinking like what am I doing day to day that I'm going to be proud of later on mm. like am I really fulfilled with the work I'm doing now right. and to a point I guess I was then but now you know that I found exactly kind of what I'm going to be doing and really love what I'm doing then it's like much more like exciting yeah, coming rewarding. to work day to day yeah yeah rewarding because when you were when i was just fresh off just starting out by myself it just i didn't know kind of how to pitch my services i didn't know like exactly how much to charge and i would spend waiting like tons more time trying to impress clients and and i don't know just i guess um i didn't want to just sell my time for money, and mm -hmm. I, I found it really tough to figure out what else I can do mm -hmm. and not constantly do that because I can only do so much of it. And I looked around, and people were building consulting businesses, and I was like, that's kind of tough. Like, I don't want to have a consulting business. It's okay, but it, like consulting business means I have to hire way more people and have them report to me, and we're going to sell a lot more time for a lot more money. And I really like was looking around and like everybody has a, some kind of product or like not everybody, but people that I was helping or my clients, they had products or, right. or things that would just generate revenue that I, they could live happily with. And, you know, like interviewing Tim Ferriss, the whole thing, like for a work week, like I met these characters that would not spend all their time working and I wanted to be that guy like I wanted to have you know work five hours a day and mm -hmm. still have a business and be able to live off of it I didn't want to be on, on my laptop at night and worrying about stuff that and dealing with calls and people and, and so yeah I guess the there was like a lot of just setbacks like I don't want to do consulting. I have to do it. I, like, how do I get to this part? Yeah. Where, like, and so, yeah, that was some of the lower points, I yeah. guess, in my sort of like entrepreneur's journey, I guess. And I think, I mean, that's so common. Everyone is trying to figure out what their calling is, right? What they're meant to do and what will be rewarding for them. How did you put yourself in a place to figure that out or did it just naturally come over time? No, I think I put myself into it, I guess. I um, deliberately quit software engineering and mm -hmm. moved to California because I wanted something new. Mm -hmm. um, deliberately tried the business side of things, trying to figure out what do I want to do mm -hmm. in terms of maybe maybe software engineering isn't my thing. Maybe like marketing or business might be my thing. And I like working with Renal, I kind of it was a lot of fun, but I couldn't get a job after an internship just because like I didn't have that much that much um, experience so I needed a little more experience so I volunteered some more and you know eventually I got the job at Zurb and it was a design firm and there I really needed to take everything I learned during internship and put it to use and it was a pretty harsh environment like I was the only marketer there I didn't know what I was doing this is the first time I was a marketer and so and people expected a lot from me and so it was a design firm how do I get them seen by everyone and so I tried everything, like all 
sorts of like reaching out to people, but you know, like nobody's gonna write a story about design firm. Hmm. And so I started doing stuff like let's go critique TechCrunch and their design and post it on our blog and get them to cover us. Or and that was crazy. Like that was like the biggest, I think the biggest traffic days that they've had. Uh, and and so like I started getting designers to write. Uh, interesting plugins and, and tools for the community to use and feature those tools and that's how we started going but I was trying to learn you know this was fun but like working there was fun uh, but I always like was looking for that like Tim Ferriss lifestyle trying to figure out how can I get to a point where I have my own business. Mm -hmm. I don't have to answer to anybody else. I can take time off whenever I want and be able to not work that much and be able to generate enough money to just live comfortably, travel the world. And so I quit Zerub again. I was six years down the line living in California. And like, look, I'm going to travel the world with my wife for six months. And that's mm -hmm. what we did. We kept this blog, we quit our jobs, and we're traveling around the world. While traveling around the world, I kept thinking, like, what am I going to do? Like, how am I going to reach that goal of, hey, I've got my own thing. I'm not working that much. It's fun. And so <laughs> I came back. I was like, look, I'm going to try consulting, but really I'm going to try and build, like, some kind of product, some kind of course that's going to generate money for me. And that's what I ended up focusing on through my consulting over the three years or whatever since we've come back from that trip around the world, um, I kind of focused on doing that and it's been good. And I still, I'm still consulting now, so I'm not like fully my product and my, my course doesn't support me yet, but um, it's moving in the right direction. Right. Uh, so, so That's great. You no, know, I appreciate you sharing your thought process and your journey through that because I think that's on the mind of almost everyone I talk to. You know, they're, they're somewhere on that continuum, you know. And yeah. so on the flip side, Dimitri, what's been one of the proudest moments in your business um, business career? I think just helping. Like I have this testimonial stage where – it's like currently collecting that slash testimonials where I put videos up mm -hmm. and these people send me videos about some of them I say they send me these giant emails and I'm like, look, I can't even feature this email on my website. Can you just record this in a video? And mm -hmm. so they record these videos and it's just how like they've transformed by me coaching them. So I kind of changed my consulting process lately and I started teaching people my skills instead of having them pay me to Do employ it. my skills. Yeah. And so I actually like cut my business a little bit because of it, because I, like they teach, they learn, and then they go employ the skills. Right. But as a, re a result, they never have to employ anybody else. Like they actually learn what I do, how right. I do it, and they'll just employ it themselves. And so it takes three months or two months to teach them how to you know, do some type of marketing strategy and then they can just run with it and it works. Yeah. And I think some of the proudest moments is when they email me or they send me a video and say, look, like, this stuff really worked for me. It changed the way I work and it's going to, you know, make my life much easier, much better in terms of, like, building my company, my business, and just thank you. And so it's What's really your favorite uh, testimony, like, the best result that you saw one of your students get? Um... I don't know, like Wistia is really fun. Like Adam does like a really funny Wistia testimonial. He's just like says, look, we like tripled the traffic. We were able to get featured in all these different hmm. um, publications. Like um, like Rami was really good, but that's very recent. I guess like Noah Kagan was kind of cool. Like to have a testimonial from him was kind of big. Yeah. I worked with him on uh, AppSumo a little bit mm -hmm. a while ago. Um, I have a whole bunch that I still haven't even put up, but yeah, just a lot of uh, like Fong Lee. We work with him. Um, he, like just long testimonial. But he's really like he like really transformed the way he does business now and mm -hmm. does marketing. And he's hired 
multiple people to support kind of like what we came up with and what we executed with him and it just you know did wonders for his business and how he markets it so just i don't know yeah. just helping people and seeing them respond like yeah. saying hey this is working thank you this is awesome and yeah dimitri this has been hugely valuable i appreciate your time and and spending the time uh educating and really sharing your expertise where should we point people towards? I know we mentioned several places, but um, what are a few that I should link up or that people should check out? Um, well, link up my course because it'll teach people how to do outreach. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, learn.criminallyprolific.com. Okay. And, and um, what else? Uh, uh, besides my course, you should link up my tool, I guess. Just reach out .io. That's my tool to help you find journalists or influencers to find, uh, you know, to find opportunities that can write about you and stuff. Yeah. So. And if nothing else, they should check that out because you really have a, I mean, in in a sense, it's like such a good copywriting. You do such good copywriting because you keep it like that one sentence pitch, like you preach, and then the the way it's designed. People should just check out the way everything's laid out and designed. It's really, really good. So, you know, even if you don't want PR, which you should after hearing this conversation, um, you should really check out how Dimitri, the copy he has on there, and also the way he lays everything out. So, oh, Dimitri, thank you so much. This has been been hugely valuable. Hey, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See, life's like a beach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand 